We're going to go ahead and begin our next service here with the song, Here is Love. Let's stand together and sing, Here is Love, Wide as an Ocean. Let's sing together. As we come to our final service in the 2020 Bible Conference, I want to give testimony of its profound influence. Not only has the preaching been wonderful and poignant this year, but over the years I look back on my experiences both as a student and faculty and staff for now 30 plus years and, and thank God for what Bible Conference has meant. I remember coming as a college student in 1984 to the very first Bible conference we had then in the spring of the year. It was the 10th year of the college. They had been having Bible conferences all along. Back then we met in the high school gym. We all walked across the tracks. Over there we sat on metal folding chairs for 11 services straight. And uh, we regretted it. And. <laughs> But what I do remember, in addition to, to the gym and the surrounding, was sitting in the concentrated preaching of God's word over a couple day period of time was something I had never experienced before. For some of the, you, this may be your first Bible conference, and to sit for a couple of days where really we think of nothing else, academic or, or otherwise, to look into the Bible in the way that we have it's a profound experience. More than experience, because to know God is not just an emotional thing, it's just not an experiential thing. It is truly and most intimately a relational thing. I, I think, I, I hope with your heart, uh, you've been knit to God himself through the preaching of his word. As president, it's been my greatest prayer. Students, it's my greatest prayer for you that you receive what I got from this place in a deeper way, that your college experience would even be better than mine, 
I want the most for you. And Bible conference this year has been just that. We've had a great balance of speakers and I don't need to go back and rehearse all of their messages with you, but I will say that their distinct styles and their personalities, more importantly, their passion and their commitment to God and his word has come through and has touched each one of us. And I thank you each one. Dr. Lands, thank you. As part of our team and as one of our speakers, thank you for your insights. Dr. Toole, we've appreciate your, appreciated your messages. Dr. Toole, among all of the speakers, is our veteran most Bible conference speaker. We're so glad to have you back. Dr. Kenny Baldwin's down the road, uh, headed toward home, but I'm sure he's looking in, and so Dr. Baldwin, thank you. Uh, thank you for the excitement that you brought to this room. And, and thanks for showing us that it's okay to be excited about God and about his word. And then Pastor Butler, thank you for gracing us with your presence, with your messages. We've enjoyed having you and your wife here as well. There are a number of individuals in addition to these four speakers, musicians, and wow, this music has been great, that all have influenced us. They don't perform for applause and these speakers don't speak for recognition. But when you get to the end of a, of, of a set of services like this, there's something that's just well enough in you, at least it is for me, that I want to say thank you in the biggest way I know how. How about we do that with a round of applause for all those involved? Dr. Atkins has reminded us over the course of our, of our sessions that uh, these can be viewed again. Go to the college website or the chapel podcast and see these again. Share them with friends. You'll be interested to know, those of you watching, you'll be interested to know that we've had viewers from all 50 states, 40 different countries, 64,000 views. So more than just us here. Uh, literally around the world. It's a great thing what God does, isn't it? And a great thing that we've all shared in our friends, our families, folks back home. I hope you'll take advantage and look back at some of these messages again. In just a moment, we'll be privileged to hear in this session from Pastor Tim Butler as our final speaker this week. When you go away from Bible conference, you have notes, you have things to remember. You may not remember who spoke what, you may not remember a particular um, a series of alliterated points, but, but I know you've been changed because God's word does that. And so we're looking forward to hearing from Pastor Butler here in just a moment. Before he comes, I'm gonna pray, and then I wanna give you a memory and ask a favor, so let's do that. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for, for this Bible conference. We thank you for Pensacola Christian College and the ability that we have to gather together freely around your, world, your word and for these speakers to share their heart and to share the guidance that you've given them to each one of us. In this session now, we ask particularly your blessing on Pastor Butler. Again, Lord, we want to see you. We want to behold you as never before. We ask all this in your name, amen. Last year, we started our Bible conference with uh, a regular opening, but right before our very first speaker of Bible conference came, it was Dr. Shane Lewis, a choir came out and they sang a song, a really big one. And if you were here last year, you remember, Behold Our God. It was awesome. In fact, Dr. Lewis got up before the first word was preached and he said, I wanna hear it again. And the entire auditorium stood and listened again to the singing of that song. It became a favorite last year. It became my favorite song last year. 
that's my fav- uh, that's my favor. I'm going to ask Gucka. We sang it yesterday, but I wonder if we could sing it again. As a congregation, I'm going to ask you if you would sing it with us, like we did yesterday. Dr. Lewis has been one of our favorite Bible conference speakers. This last year, he's battled with cancer again, had a bone marrow transplant. Just today, I heard a good report and a clear report, and we thank God for that. So Shane, if you're watching, sing along with us. Austin, you come and tell us about how to sing this song. I can tell you from being up here that there is nothing like hearing you sing. When we sing this, this is our last opportunity to really pour our hearts into this. Behold our God. And we'll sing it just like we did before. However, I just want to give a little instruction. When we get to the chorus, there's a part that we call the bridge where we'll lift up the refrain, you will reign forever. And there's an echo part there. So the men, we would sing, you will reign forever. And then ladies, you would echo, let your glory fill the earth. As we are singing through the song, the symphonic choir is actually going to come up to the platform. They'll be singing afterwards, and they'll join us to help fill that out. But would you just determine, boy, I'm going to pour it, give it all out. Let's stand together. Think about these words as we sing, Behold our God, who has held the ocean in his hands. Let's sing together. Who has held the ocean?
1 Samuel chapter 17 in the Word of God this evening. And my goodness, wasn't that song good? Behold our God. I'm going to tell you, my Baptist mule just about got loose in the aisle. I'm going to go North Carolina on you before it's over with if you keep that up. That was tremendous singing. And Dr. Shoemaker, I want to thank you once again for the kind invitation to come and to be here. All the kindnesses that have been shown to us. And it has been a great week. And I don't know what God has done in your life, but God has used you in my life in a tremendous way. I mentioned Monday or Monday evening when we started, I hope that we could see Jesus. And I have seen him this week. He's spoken to me. And uh, he's used you to minister to my heart in so many ways. And I thank you for all of the delicious meals, the kind hospitality. I echo what Brother Kenny Baldwin said, well, all of those baskets of food. I want you to know every fat cell in my body has been singing the Hallelujah Chorus all week long. And I thank you so much. The music has been so good. I want to commend you also for your very, your very warm spirit that you have here. The Lord's here. It's easy to sense that. And the Lord's working in hearts and in lives. And I thank you so much for allowing him to do that. The messages have been good. I'll tell you, I feel a little bit out of place being here with such a stellar lineup of speakers. I kind of feel like the man that entered his mule into the Kentucky Derby. Somebody said, that, did you expect him to win? He said, no, but he sure was running with some good company. And a good company like Dr. Lands, what tremendous messages that we have heard from him. Whom do men say that I am? Who do you say that he is? What a great thought. And then the tremendous thought that uh, Dr. Toole left with us last night, I, I, I cannot get uh, a past that, to be content with the manna that we have. And then, Brother Kenny Baldwin, what can you say there? I know one thing, I will never read the story of Ehud and Eglon the same again. <laughs> when the sword went in, the dirt came out. I'm thinking, man, there's a country song in there somewhere. I don't know where, <laughs> you know. But it was tremendous. And I hope that God has encouraged you today. And I hope that he has given you what you have needed. I think in a conference like this, you tend to find what you're looking for. And I pray that you're looking still for Jesus. Very familiar text of scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read it for you and I want you to follow along with me. In the first few verses there, 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. And were gathered together at Shoketh, which belongeth to Judah. And pitched between Shoka and Azekah in Ephraim's Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits in a span and he had a helmet of brass on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Valley of Elah. It's a valley that is located where this battle, the most famous battle in all of the Old Testament occurred. The reason that this battle is so famous is it's not between a battle between two armies, but it was a battle that was between uh, two people. Even those that really don't have a Bible background know about this story. All you have to do is say David and Goliath. It was a story that resonates with most of us because in so many ways our lives, all of them, face obstacles that at times seem insurmountable. I guess you would call them giants. And it's an important story. In fact, it's one of the longest chapters in the book of 1 Samuel. There are 912 Hebrew words that tell this story. We're told in great detail about this battle. In fact, there's more, uh, uh, more detail given to us about this particular battle in the Bible than any other battle in all of the Word of God. 
We're told about the physical dimensions even of the combatant. We're told about how tall he was, how large he was. And we learn some great lessons from this story from a young man by the name of David. He was one of, if not the greatest king that Israel ever had. He's continually honored throughout the Bible. He has his own tomb in Israel. If you ever go there, you would see it. If you look on the flag of Israel, it is, it is uh, graced with the star of David. David was a big deal then. And I want to tell you tonight, David's a big deal now. And when we look at his life, we realize that there are some great lessons that we can learn from the life of this king named David. Now, when you come to this story, however, you have to be very careful, and here's why. The story of David is similar in this regard to the Christmas story. You've heard it before. You know the plot. You know the characters. You know how it is going to end. And if you're not careful, you're going to check out on me right about now. But I want to encourage you and ask you for the next few moments, don't check out on me. Not yet. Because tonight you're going to learn some things this evening. In fact, you're going to learn some things you've already overlooked about this story. And so here's the battle that is shaping up here. You've got this huge giant that would make Shaq look like a junior higher. And this guy is is going to fight a battle, and it's not against another soldier, not even against another man, but he's fighting this battle against a youth, a teenager. Many believe David is somewhere between the ages of 15 and 19 years of age, probably doesn't have his learner's permit, can't drive his father's chariot, and he's the... He's the youngest son of Jesse, he's the smallest in stature, and and if you'd have been on the battlefield that day and you would have taken a look over there, you, you would have been like everyone else. And it, you're kidding me. That is going to fight that? Seriously? And this story, however, captures one of David's finest hours. Because this is the story of when the boy David sat down and the man rose up. And what we learn from this story of this youth is how to face and fight giants in our own lives. And we begin to learn a little bit about the secret to obtaining victory in our Christian life. Because the truth is everyone faces giants. Some of you are facing giants right now. They're physical giants. It has to do with your physical health. It might be with sickness or disease. Sometimes they're marital giants and perhaps your marriage is here tonight and, and, and you're wondering, is it even going to survive? And maybe your giant is a financial debt and you're so a, a, de- a, a financial woe and a giant and you're thinking, how in the world will we ever get out of this debt? Maybe yours is an emotional giant and the truth is you're you're disillusioned and you're even depressed with life. And maybe yours is a spiritual giant. And you've been in such a season of life where it's so dry and barren. And it seems like God is nowhere to be found. And you're just tempted to throw in the towel and give up and wave the white flag of surrender and say, I can't do this anymore. I can't defeat this giant. Yes, you can, if you will do what David did. It's a simple message. I want to give you three thoughts to think about this evening. I want you to notice with me, first of all, what the majority saw. Let me set this up for you. You've got Israel fighting a group of people called the Philistines. They They are great enemies with each other. You've got the Israelites on one side of this valley of Elah, you've got the Philistines on the other side of the valley. And the Israelites had a giant problem, and the problem was a giant. They'd been putting up with this giant now for six weeks. Now, the author of the scripture here wants us to know how big he was and how intimidating he was because he's given us here the most detailed description of a soldier that we're given in all of the scripture. Look at verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. 
And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. He's called here in this passage a champion. You might want to underline that word in your Bible because it's the only time this word is used and it's used referring to this giant called Goliath. The word means this. It means a man between two armies. So here this guy is, many believe he's about nine foot, nine inches tall. To put that in our modern vernacular, here is a guy that could dunk a basketball standing flat footed. He's got a bronze undergarment shirt on that weighs 175 pounds. The head of the spear that he is carrying weighs 25 pounds. He is a big individual and here's what he's done. He has come down and challenged Israel to a one-on-one, -on -one, me and you, winner take all fight. And he has been doing it every day for six weeks. And nobody has volunteered to fight it. In fact, of the matter... Israel is getting desperate. Saul the king is getting desperate. Saul has even tried to bribe someone into going out and fighting him in verse 25. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Saul is trying to get them to go out and, and face this giant. But all they could see was how big he was. The king said, look, somebody, anybody, just go out and take a shot at him. Just And if you win, I'm telling you, it's going to be instant fortune, instant fame. You're going to be a part of the royal family. He said, you will be on easy street for the rest of your life. And he said, I'll, I'll even make it where you don't have to pay any taxes. Just go and take a shot. But there are no takers. I mean, no interest whatsoever. King couldn't, couldn't find anyone to fight. Soldiers were saying, I don't care how much money you offer me. I'm not fighting that guy. I, I don't care how pretty your daughter is. I, I, I'm not fighting that guy. And so he, they're thinking in their mind, uh, nobody is willing to come and take a shot at this guy. And so the king wouldn't do it. The private wouldn't do it. The sergeant wouldn't do it. The captain wouldn't do it. And, uh, and the general himself wouldn't do it. No one but would fight the battle. And here's the reason... Because they were all focused on the giant. All they could see was the giant. Hey, here's a note to self. You will never get rid of your insecurity in life if you are always focused on your problem. Your faith is going to diminish and your fear is going to rise in your life when you are focused on your giant. Well, it's at this setting that this young kid named David shows up. And it doesn't take David long to size up the situation. And we're about to hear his first words as he has arrived here on the battlefield. And you find them in verse 26. And David spoke, uh, spake to the men that stood by him saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now I want you to underline the last word in that verse, verse 26. It is the word God. And here's why. Let me tell you why this word at this time is so important. Because if you go back and read the first 26 verses, this is the first time that God is mentioned. You know why? Because everyone has been focused on the giant. Nobody's thinking about God. Nobody's got God on their radar. I mean, what has this army been thinking about for the last six weeks? Verse 25, and the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is come up surely to defy Israel as he come up? Look, they're saying, this guy keeps coming out here day after day. He has been doing this now for, for 40 days. And every time Goliath would come down to the valley of Elah, here's what the men of Israel were saying. They would say, look how much bigger he is than we are. And then David shows up, looks at him. Look how much smaller he is than my God is. Now stay with me. 
David has heard the same thing that they've heard. David has seen the same thing that they have seen. But everyone else was focused on this giant. But David's focus was on his God. Everyone else was shaking because of the the giant. But David's not shaking because David's secure in the presence of God. Can I just tell you this evening that whatever controls your look in life is going to control your life. David had his focus on God. Listen, when you're facing problems you think you can't solve or an obstacle you think you can't get over, whenever you're thinking that, uh, facing that giant you don't think you can defeat, fear will always cause you to focus on the giant. But faith will focus on God every time. A fear will leave you shaking, but faith leaves you settled. It leaves you secure. So... If you read this story, I challenge you to do something. If you circle every time in this story that David mentions the giant, you know how many times you would have to circle the the giant? You'd only have to do that twice. He talked about the giant once. He talked to the giant on another occasion. But if you circle in your Bible every time that God is mentioned by David, you would circle that ten times. So for every one time that he has mentioned the giant, he has mentioned God five times. But I'm afraid here's what we do when we're focusing on our giant. We turn that ratio around. But for every one time that David talked about the giant, he's talking about God five different times. Listen, God wasn't on the radar screen for Saul. But I want you to know God filled the radar screen for David. Listen, the next time you're facing your problem, your difficulty, your giant, and you think, I can't do anything about it. Look, you can't keep your focus on the giant. You've got to get your focus on the God. You see what they saw. Second thing I want you to notice what they knew. What did David know here? Well, there's, here's the good news for Israel. Someone has finally showed up to this battle and said, yeah, I'll I'll take this guy on. I'm not afraid of this guy. I'll fight him. That's the good news. But the bad news, it's a kid. It's a a teenager. He's not a battle-tested soldier. He's a shepherd boy and an inexperienced shepherd boy at that. He's never held a sword. He's never worn a helmet. He has never fought in a battle. He's never seen a battlefield, much less been on a battlefield. So that raises the question that begs to be answered. Why was David ready to run to the fight when everyone else was running from the fight? Well, look at verse number 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came, out a, came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David... Go, and the Lord be with thee. Man, don't you know that the the scripture sometimes has a sense of humor here? Don't, Don't you love Saul's bravery right here? What a king. Go sick him, David. You go get him, and we're gonna fight him to the last drop of your blood. Pretty incredible that it takes a shepherd kid to remind a king and his entire army just how great and mighty God is. Ask yourself this question. Why do you fear your giant so much? Why do you worry so much? Why do we quit so easily? Why, why do we run away so quickly? Here's why. Because we, we forget what we ought to remember. And we remember what we ought to forget. 
We magnify the giant that's before us. And when we do that, we minimize the God that's within us. And we only do it all the time. I'm telling you, every time you worry, you are maximizing the giant and minimizing God. And see, the reason David could face the present and he was unafraid of the future is because he remembered what God had done for him in the past. He said, man, do you think I'm afraid of this guy? Let me tell you what God has done for me. He said, I, I have uh, killed lions and bears with a stick in my bare hand. And look, do you think I'm afraid of him? If God can take care of the lions and the bears with just the stick and, and me as a young man, he said, I think God can take care of the giant. And here's the reason David could say that. David realized something. David knew he was able to kill that lion and to kill that bear, not because of his power, but it was because of God's power that was working through his life. He said, I know where the power comes from. It's not from me, but it's from him. Let me tell you this. If you remember what God has done for you yesterday, you'll believe what he can do for you today. And then you'll be confident in what he can do for you tomorrow. I want you to think about where you are right now. And the reason that you are where you are right now is because God took care of you yesterday. If God didn't take care of you yesterday, this whole place would be empty. But if God took care of you yesterday, God can handle today. And if he can handle today, he can handle tomorrow. And David remembered what everyone else had forgotten. David believed in what everyone else had doubted. And that's the reason that David stepped up when everyone else stepped back off of that battlefield. And I'm saying tonight, when you see the God that others don't, you'll do for God what others want. David had his eyes focused on God. What David had to help them realize was this. When you have a problem. He said, men, here's what your problem is. He said, you think the giant's your problem, but the giant's not your problem. Because at the end of the day, there was only one giant that they all had to face in that army. You know what it was? It was the giant of fear. That's what paralyzes us. That's what paralyzes you sometimes. That's what stops you in your track. That's what stops you from moving forward in your Christian experience. That's what causes you to stop praying and it causes you to stop reading the word and stop going to church and stop sharing the gospel. That, that, that are we give up too quickly because of fear in our lives. And yes, there's trials and there's trouble and there's temptation and it may look like a giant and sound like a giant and feel like a giant, but there's one giant that we all face more than any and it's this giant of fear. And here's what happens. Fear will always say, look how much bigger that giant is than I am. But faith says, no, 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 no. Look how much smaller that giant is than God. And folks, that's the difference. So the scene set. The fight's about to start. People are making their bets. And who do you think is betting on David? Well, let me just say the Philistines are not betting on David. The Israelites are not betting on David. Saul's not betting on David. David's brothers are not betting on David. And the truth is David isn't even betting on David. Because David is betting on God. Oh, he's not betting his money, he's betting his very life on God. And do you know why David was so confident? Because he knew God. With God, he, he said, I'll always win. So here they are. You see what David saw. You see what David knew. And I want you to notice here what David did. Fight's about to begin. And there's one thing they have all agreed on. And that is this. It is going to be a short fight. And uh, it's one of those where they said, hey, get your cell phone out quick because you want to get this at the very beginning because it's just not going to last long. So hit the record button right away. And so here's what you got. If you could sum it up, you have got an 18-wheeler running at about 100 miles an hour into a Cooper Mini. That's getting ready to happen. 
And here are the Philistines, man, and they couldn't wait, and the Israelites couldn't watch. And they're all wondering, what's the last words that David, this little run of a kid, is going to utter? Well, you have them in verse number 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a uh, spear and with a shield, but I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and all this ascent shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. David stops and said, hey, listen up. I've got something to say. Philistines, I want you to listen up. Israelites, I want you to listen up. Goliath, I especially want you to listen up. I want my brothers to listen up. And he says, this, this is not about me. This is not about Goliath he said this is about God and he said understand this I'm not here today to fight for fame I don't need anyone's fame I'm not here to fight for Saul's money I don't need his money I'm not here to fight to get into Saul's family I've already got a family and he said I I want you to understand and get this straight. He said, I'm fighting this battle today for one reason. He said, I'm fighting it for the glory of God. I'm fighting it in the name of God, believing I'll be delivered by the power of God, and I'm doing it all for the glory of God. And remember this, they've all heard the same thing. They've all seen the same thing. But David says something that they've completely forgotten for six weeks. He said, this is not my battle. This is his battle. He said, I'm not fighting for God, but God is going to fight through me. You know, this is one of the most well-read stories in all of Scripture. One of the most famous stories in all of the Bible but I believe it's one of the most misunderstood stories. It's not a story about a giant. It's a story about the giant. This is not a story about a boy who killed a giant for God. This is about a, a story about a God that killed a giant for a boy. The battle here was the Lord's battle. And understand, this is not a story about the giants that we face. It's a story about the God who fights battles against the giants that we face. You see, we've got this idea that life is so tough and, and, and it is a battle. And sometimes it is tough and sometimes there are battles. But don't miss this. Don't ever forget this. If you're a believer tonight, the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. The war is not yours. The war is His. So get this picture. You've got this nine foot, nine inch giant. His sword is taller than David. His shield weighs more than David. He comes out there. This teenage kid walks out with five rocks and a slingshot. Be honest. Who would you have bet on? You say, we're Baptists. We don't bet. I understand that. But you would have bet the farm on this one, I promise you. You thought, man, this will be easy money right here. Look, look at verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh, uh, drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead. And he said, man, nothing like that's ever entered my mind before. Oh, I'm sorry. I got excited. That's in the King Timothy version. And then he went on and he said, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Do you remember his last words? What were David's last words? He said, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. You see, David was not fighting the giant for God. God was fighting this giant. For David. Let me, in, let me let you in on something here. And just for full clarity. The fight was fixed. <laughs> okay. 
Goliath never had a chance, folks. Because Goliath wasn't fighting David. Goliath was fighting God. And David did not kill Goliath for God. God killed Goliath for David. You see, David got the victory. Oh, but friend, God is the one that got the glory here. And that's all that David cared about. That was the reason he was a man after God's own heart. David didn't care about fame, about fortune, or reputation. All he was concerned about is that God would get the glory. Now, don't miss this. Because if you finish reading this story and, and you begin to read the remaining part of David's life all the way to his death, you will never find David bragging about killing Goliath. He just doesn't talk about it. Do you know why David fought that giant? Here's why. Look at verse 46. He said, I'm doing this that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You know tonight, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your number one purpose and goal in life should be to live in such a way that people would be able to say, by looking at you, there is a God in Israel. You ought to be willing to stand up for what's right and fight against what's wrong no matter what it may cost you so people would know that there is a God in Israel. You should be willing to share the gospel with people so that they can come to know this God of Israel. Because listen, we are living in a world that is rapidly forgetting that there is a God in Israel. And we need to be willing to say to this world, look, criticize us if you will, mock us if you will, be that as it may, we are going to live in such a way and walk in such a way and talk in such a way and conduct ourselves in such a way that whether people like it or not they're going to know one thing there's a God in Israel there's a God that is still on his throne in his universe and the government's not the one in control and the president's not the one in control the economy's not the one in control but the God of Israel is the one that's in control and that's what David is trying to help us to understand this evening now I may not have told you anything tonight that you didn't know but this story gets just a little deeper if I had to ask you before this message tonight what the story of David and Goliath was about, you would probably have said, well, it's a story really about the underdog winning when nobody really gave him much of a chance, and that's really not the way it is. The story is not about David primarily. It's not even about Goliath primarily. It's not about you and me primarily. This is a story about God. And David wants us to know something. If David could take a few moments and close this tonight and could share a couple of things for us this evening, I think this is what he would say to you. There is a God that still saves. There is a God that still rescues. There is a God that still delivers. There is a God that still fights giants and there's still a God that will fight battles for you. And there is a God that will win your victory because the story is not about a shepherd, but it's about a savior. It's a story really about Jesus. And let me explain. Where was David born and where did David live the early years of his life? city of where was Jesus born oh come on talk to me David was a shepherd Jesus called himself the good the giant taunted Israel for 40 days Jesus was tempted by the devil for say why the parallels and there's many more I'll tell you why because 3,000 years ago, the only one who could face that giant was David, the ancestor of Jesus. But 1,000 years later, the only one that could face that giant called Satan was Jesus, the son of David. 
A thousand years after David fought his giant, Jesus didn't fight one giant, he fought two. He fought Satan and he fought sin. And just like his ancestor David, he knelt down, but this time in a garden, and he didn't pick up five smooth stones, but he picked up an old rugged cross. And where David lived, Jesus died, and where uh, David later died, Jesus rose from the dead. The first David needed God to defeat his giant for him. The second David was God who defeated our giant for us. The first David never shed a drop of his blood, never got a scratch on his entire body, but the second David shed his blood and his body was bruised and battered and beaten beyond recognition. The first David died and went to dust. The second David died and came back from the grave. And because of him, we don't have to run from any giant. Because of him, we can run to any giant and win any battle with any giant. And we can defeat any giant that we face. Why? Because we now have a God that is with us, a God that is for us. We have a God that is in us, and he's bigger than any giant that we will ever face. And praise God, his name is Jesus. And when you look and see Jesus, you can face all of your giants and know that you will always win with Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you so much for this story that we've heard it for years. But Lord, this understanding helps us to see just how interested you are in our life to fight battles for us. And I pray for students, for parents, for relationships that are represented here tonight, that you would show yourself strong and mighty and fight battles and win victories for them. Lord, I pray that you would help us not to be focused on our giants, but Lord, help us to see with eyes of faith our Savior and his almighty power. And I pray that you would do for us exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And I pray for these students as they return to class this next week, that you would give them a brand new perspective of just how great and mighty. And as we have sang tonight, to behold you in all of your glory and splendor. And I pray that they would see there is a God waiting to step into their life and step into their situation and slay giants for them. Thank you for this week. I pray that as a result of it, that we will leave here changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.